questions. I'm Dan Palazzolo, co-director, along with Gary McDowell of the Marshall Center for Statesmanship at the Jepson School of Leadership Studies, and I want to welcome here this afternoon for our, our last lecture of the fall semester. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Eugene Trani. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Trani received a BA in history from the University of Notre Dame and an MA and PhD in history from Indiana University. He has had a distinguished career as a teacher, scholar, and academic leader. After teaching appointments at Ohio State and Southern Illinois, he held various administrative leadership positions at the University of Nebraska, the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and the University of Wisconsin before being appointed the fourth president of Virginia Commonwealth University. Under Dr. Trani's leadership, VCU experienced outstanding an outstanding increase in size and quality of enrollment, in program development, and campus development. It would be impossible to imagine the VCU campus today, perhaps even the city of Richmond, without the remarkable strides made under Dr. Trani's leadership. In this respect, he is not just a student and scholar of history, but a maker of history as well. Dr. Trani has also been a Fulbright lecturer at Moscow State University and held visiting research positions at the University of London, St. John's, Cambridge, University College Dublin, and Lincoln College of Oxford. He is author and co-author of seven books, including The First Cold War, The Legacy of Woodrow Wilson and U.S.-Soviet Relations. I have it on good authority that the book has been published in Chinese and Russian. <laughs> However, no need to worry. We have English copies available outside in the lobby. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tron. Thanks, Dan. If you really are interested, <laughs> here's the Russian one, which was published by Ulmer Press uh, the same year, and then the Chinese one was published by the Peking University Press. So Dan is right. I am very pleased to be here at the University of Richmond. Uh, and uh, I want to have two connections with the University of Richmond right off the bat. Uh, you ask, I will tell you whether you're interested or not. What do ex-presidents do? Well, I am still teaching in the Honors College. I just finished an Honors module, a six-week module. It was the best course I've had. I teach it every year, uh, and it's on leadership, and I use uh, Professor Wren's reader as one of the readings uh, uh, for the uh, book. So a real connection with, obviously, this school uh, and one of the uh, senior professors at this school. The second connection is an interesting connection. Uh, so I did my doctoral dissertation on the Treaty of Portsmouth, Theodore Roosevelt's mediation of the Russo-Japanese War, and then had the great fortune to go work for a year with Arthur Link, uh, who edited the papers of Woodrow Wilson. So I spent a year in the bowels of Firestone Library, 1969-1970. And I worked on the editing project a lot, but he allowed me to work on Woodrow Wilson in Russia, a logical continuation uh, of uh, the book on Theodore Roosevelt in Russia. I followed that up by going to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and continued to work on the book and then went into administration in 1975. And as Dan said at Nebraska at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, at the People's Republic of Madison, Wisconsin, before I came here, uh, and then at VCU since 1990. And the only thing I had done on the book was go off and teach at Moscow University in 1981 for four months. I'd been to Russia probably 20 times, but that was the epical experience which told me I had to figure out how to get back to do this book on Woodrow Wilson in Russia. Lo and behold, I had the great opportunity to meet Gary McDowell, and he invited me uh, both on the board of the Institute for U.S. Studies at the University of London, and then in the summer of 1995 for three months to spend time at the University of London. And it was that sabbatical that rekindled this book uh, and followed up three years later by going to St. John's in Cambridge. Uh, and then the book got done. Uh, 
And I figured out you could be an administrator and continue to do scholarships. So in the period of time since then, while still president, I did another two books on American-Russian relations, uh, one called Distorted Mirrors, Americans and Their Relations with Russia and China in the 20th Century. That was published in English by the University of Missouri, in Russian, in Chinese, uh, and in Spanish. And then a biography of Harrison Salisbury, who you may remember was the New York Times correspondent in Moscow uh, from 1949 to 1954. Uh, and he was the reporter who knew too much. Uh, and uh, Stalin hated him. They actually brought Stalin a plan to kill him, uh, which Stalin figured out quite uh, correctly that everybody would know what happened. Uh, so uh, he survived Stalin and won a Pulitzer Prize for articles when he got back uh, to the United States on uh, the Soviet Union after Stalin. So I continue scholarship and I am now teaching and working on book actually number 11 and 12. One is a history of VCU uh, and the other one is uh, in fact another book on American-Russian relations, and I'll back into that at the end. I do have a prepared remark a text, and I'm going to try to do it. And, and Dan and Gary said, you can talk 35 to 40 minutes. The last time I tested this, it was 42 minutes. <laughs> so I am going to use prepared remarks. And the title is Woodrow Wilson and the Origins of the Cold War, 100 years later and still relevant. 100 years ago, last month, November, the Bolshevik Revolution took place in Russia. In the period of time since 1917, American-Russian relations have been troubled, but generally consistent. From Lenin to Putin, from Wilson to Trump, no matter who the leader, relations have been difficult, and it all started with Woodrow Wilson. He was the first Cold War warrior and his influence continues today. So let us review Wilson's presidency and his views and actions regarding Russia. President Wilson believed that no one power should dominate Europe, but rather there must be a balance of power, always including America. It must continue to be in America's primary interest to participate in this balance. That meant not only preventing Germany from dominating Europe, whether it was the Kaiser or Hitler at a later period of time, uh, but also Russia, whether it was Lenin, Stalin, or Putin. In this sense, Wilson was a realist and an internationalist. This Wilsonian awareness that America could no longer be isolationist, but must be an integral part of Europe remains today. For example, just recently by a vote of 98 to 2, the United States Senate approved legislation that would increase economic sanctions against Russia because of its interference in the American electoral campaign. This legislation will also prevent President Donald J. Uh, J. Trump without first getting congressional approval from removing the original and subsequent sanctions leveled against President Vladimir Putin's government beginning in 2014. The House of Representatives also approved this action by a vote of 419 to 3. Trump was forced to sign it, or his veto would have easily been overturned. Wilson would smile approvingly at these sanctions. It was he who 100 years ago established a similar policy against the newly founded Soviet government. This policy, his administration termed quarantine, but other administrations eventually renamed it containment. In either case, we closely identified quarantine with a latter era from 1945 to 1991, one which we call the Cold War. Wilson is the father of those later policies associated with the Cold War. Why is this so? December 1917. Although President Wilson preferred to ignore the Bolshevik Revolution, Others pressed him to act. Alternatives were proposed. The British considered aid to Lenin's Russian enemies in order to restore the Eastern Front of World War I. The French concurred, 
and talked about allied intervention to restore the provisional government. Secretary of State Robert Lansing argued for some form of aid to those Russians still willing to fight. Colonel Edward M. House, the president's confidant, considered reconciliation, not recognition, in order not to force the Russian into Germans' hands. Americans in Petrograd, what St. Petersburg came to be known as before it became Leningrad, had their own ideas about what U.S. policy towards the Bolsheviks should be. Everything from the total irreconcilability of Ambassador David Francis to the Bolsheviks, to accommodation to the Bolsheviks, uh, recommended by the military attache in Petrograd, General William Judson. He wanted to preserve the Eastern Front as long as possible and prevent Russia from falling completely into German hands. At first, doing nothing, as Ambassador Francis correctly assumed, became President Wilson's way of dealing with the Bolsheviks. The president expected that their government would soon collapse, but selecting that procedure created a sort of policy vacuum in the sense that something might have been done to try to retain the Eastern Front, overthrow the Bolsheviks uh, with a pro-allied government or convince Lenin that was in his interest to fight on or make the Germans pay a very heavy price for Russian neutrality. To summarize, there were many alternatives for dealing with Bolsheviks, confronted President Wilson. Ambassador Francis supported the watching and waiting policy of Wilson and Lansing. General D Judson and Ray Robbins, head of the U.S. Red Cross mission, preferred offering an olive branch to the Bolsheviks in the hopes of keeping them in the war or belligerently neutral. Wilson rejected the olive branch alternative. The British and the French supported aiding counter-revolution. Wilson put that alternative on hold. Similarly, Secretary Lansing's beliefs, his anti-Bolshevik uh, beliefs, uh, Wilson was inclined toward those, but they remained speculation for the time being. What intrigued Wilson was House's newest suggestion to mobilize democratize and rejoin Russia through an appeal to ideas. The president must wage a propaganda campaign to this end, similar to George Creel of the Committee on Public Information Strategy. The campaign must stress the fairness and reasonableness of Wilson's gospel to all belligerents, territorial integrity, and self-determination. All Wilson had to do was speak to the Russian people directly, and he believed this would occur. January 1918. The Bolshevik clamor for a clear enunciation of the Allied war aims forced a statement out of President Wilson. There was a chance that the Bolsheviks might remain in the war if they feared German peace terms and believed in the fair deal from the Allies. Recognition and massive aids were essential components of any deal but Wilson would have none of that. Rather, Wilson intended to offer all belligerents territorial integrity and self-determination. These principles applied to Russia constituted Wilson's famous acid test of allied goodwill in his point six of his 14 points address of January the 8th, 1918. The Bolsheviks did not respond positively to that. The Bolshevik Commissar for Foreign Affairs, Trotsky, taunted the peoples and governments of the Western Allies, especially the United States, by touting the Bolshevik peace program. It is necessary, Trotsky said, to say clearly and precisely what is the peace program of France, Italy, Great Britain, and the United States. If it was necessary, he continued, to liberate Alsace-Lorraine, Galatia, and Poznan, what about Ireland, Egypt, and India? No sooner had Trotsky thrown down the gauntlet before the Allies that he discovered the Germans proposed retention of their conquest in Eastern Europe. They also refused to allow the Russians to check uh, the prohibition of troop transfers or permit commercial navigation of the White Seas. And the Bolsheviks were very angry and there was a possibility 
that there would be no treaty between the Russians, the Soviets, and the Germans. So the prospects of a break at Brest-Litovsk seemed great, and Ambassador Francis was, said he was willing to swallow pride, sacrifice dignity, and with discretion do all that is necessary to prevent Russia from becoming an ally of Germany. But in the end, the Soviet government on March the 15th, 1918, ratified the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk to bring peace between the Soviets, or Russia, and the Germans. A fateful decision. In the early months of 1918, American officials began to fear the munitions stockpiles in Murmansk and Archangel in North Russia that they would fall into German hands. To protect these munitions was no easy task given the turmoil in Russia and the lack of formal relations with the Bolshevik government. Wilson hoped to be able to convince the Russian people uh, that they should uh, not support the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. But in fact, once the Soviets signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, uh, his point six of the 14 points also failed, and the great German offensive against France began three days later on March the 21st, 1918. So the Allied pressure to resurrect some form of an Eastern Front was the major point of the focus of the Allied nations, especially France and the United Kingdom. Pressure for America to support intervention in some form in North Russia and in Siberia, especially from the British, was continued and increasing. Now, the British had a lot of reasons to worry about Germany and Russia coming together. London's interest in intervention derived from a fear of German victory, concern about investments, alarm as to German and Bolshevik advances into British possessions, especially India, and of course the threat of Bolshevism as it became clear what the Bolsheviks were interested. But the British believed that American participation in any intervention was essential if the intervention were to be successful because it would be the Americans that would supply the manpower, the supplies, and the finances. Wilson, his policy was to let events work themselves out and to oppose every plan to intervene. Events were moving too fast. They were kaleidoscopic, so he told financier Thomas W. Lamont. Writing to Harvard's president, Charles W. Eliot, he unburdened himself. I wish most earnestly that it were possible to find some way to help, but as soon as we have thought out a working plan, there is a dissolution of the few crystals that form there. During the months between January and April, he was increasingly unhappy with the Bolsheviks as they had broken up the Russian Constituent Assembly in January and signed the formal treaty, the final treaty with the Germans in March. But he was opposed to any intervention. By April and May, he realized he would have to give in on Russia. He had considered possible intervention in northern Russia as a way that could stop the pressure from the British and the French and protect the supplies that were there. The campaign, he believed, had more, though not much more, military value, and it bypassed the Japanese, who would have involved, been involved in any Siberian intervention. But he wanted to put severe limits on what that intervention would look like. A strong Allied press for American participation in, America, in, Russian, uh, in Russia began uh, with action by the Supreme War Council of Joint Note 25, transportation of Czech troops from Siberia. This note called for Allied support of the Czech troops who were there to concentrate, which were to concentrate in Vladivostok, Murmansk, and Archangel. And these were Czech troops that went to Russia to fight the Germans during the First World War. The meeting of the Supreme War Council on January 1st through 3rd, 1918, concerned both northern Russia and Siberia. It seized on Wilson's possible concession on northern Russia. Allied troops were to take Mar Murmansk and Archangel in North Russia, but 
Wilson forced Marshal Ferdinand Foch, the commander in chief of Allied uh, forces, to go on record in support of that operation. And dutifully, Foch replied, the value of the plan occupation was indisputable. The Allies moved quickly on Wilson's concession and Allied troops went to North Russia. If the beleaguered president thought that his concession on North Russia would be enough, he was mistaken. The Allies also wanted intervention in Siberia uh, and they exerted all kinds of pressure, particularly the British and the French. Uh, the French tried to convince Wilson and he told the French that he awaited the advice of General Foch I would, quote, in the first to desire unity in the high command, and it is not for me to give a bad example and refuse to recognize his authority. And the July meeting of the Supreme uh, uh, War Council was when, in fact, uh, the decision was made. The Allies presented their most forceful case with the British, the French, and the Italian prime ministers appealing directly to Wilson. All the while, Wilson had hoped that Russia would solve its own problems, but then now he realized he would have to do something. So he agreed to the dispatch of 7,000 American troops to Siberia, in addition to a couple thousand to North Russia. Uh, but he first checked with the Czech leader, Thomas Macker, uh, Masaryk, because in fact, it was the Czech troops that Wilson decided he could support. He viewed the Czech troops as an instrument to end Allied pressure. The president set severe limits on intervention and attempted to restrict political involvement. He did not accept uh, Lansing's suggestion of a political high commissioner. He agreed to provide a limited force to guard supplies in North Russia and to assemble 7,000 troops at Vladivostok. He claimed that victory would want be won or lost on the Western Front, and no sooner had the Allied intervention begun in September 1918, then World War I ended in November of 1918. So the major part of Allied rationale for its troops being in Russia uh, collapsed. Wilson's quarantine. Initially, Wilson, though a PhD trained political science, had little understanding of Russia. To make matters worse, he made poor appointments in choosing the diplomats he sent to there. Nonetheless, the United States was the first country to recognize Russia's democratic provisional government in March 1917, before the Bolsheviks took over, after the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II. He then faced a major decision whether or not to recognize the Bolshevik Revolution of November and Lenin's communist government, and he decided he would not do that. The result was what was called the Colby Note, named after his Secretary of State, Bainbridge Colby, and its subsequent extension by Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover and Charles Evans Hughes, Secretary of State, during President Harding's administration. The United States would do the following. Not extend recognition to Russia. Limit talks to pragmatic items. Restrict trade to approved private enterprises with no US government guarantees. Again, this is reminiscent of today's sanction based relationship between the United States and Russia. The revised Colby note put Russia on notice that the United States will wait until Lenin's government either fell or significantly changed its behavior. True, there was no arms race, but there was suspicion, misunderstanding, and fear. Wilson believed that until the Soviet government became more moderate, it was useless to engage it diplomatically or otherwise. His Republican presidential successors agreed. Their refusal to recognize the Soviet Union came from a strong belief that its influence was harmful uh, and would spread uh, into Western Europe. This policy, this quarantine policy that Wilson set up lasted from 1917 until 1933 when President Franklin D. Roosevelt came into office and among the things he did was immediately extend diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union in 1933. Eventually, we fought a war as an ally of the Soviet Union against Germany. But quickly after that war, because of Soviet intransigence over Poland, 
and German partition, uh, partitioning, uh, that fell apart. And Harry Truman, FDR's successor, who became president in 1945, surrounded himself with very knowledgeable aides in foreign affairs. George C. Marshall as his first Secretary of State, and then his Secretary of Defense, and Dean Acheson as his long-term Secretary of State. And Truman had many of the same ideas that Wilson had. He came to believe that the most important job for the United States was to restore Europe for after the ravages of World War II. The Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, the Berlin blockade and airlift, the creation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the establishment of the United Nations were all parts of that vision. Truman was emphatic, emphatic that the USSR was no friend of the United States or its Western allies. He reversed much of FDR's rapprochement with the USSR, though he had supported uh, cooperation during the war to defeat Nazi Germany. In all of this, as with Wilson before him, Truman believed that America's primary commitment must always be to Europe as an integral part, piece of that whole, while never allowing any one power to dominate. And I should note as a footnote, in the end he fired Douglas MacArthur as the supreme commander of American troops in the Far East because MacArthur wanted a major war with China. And Truman said, no, 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 it is Europe and it is the Soviet Union, it is Russia, that are the major enemies of the United States. Wilson's intellectual reputation lent credibility to America's Cold War policy from Presidents Truman to Reagan and George H.W. Bush. And therefore, you can see a direct connection between Wilson and the collapse of the USSR. All of this means that Wilson had come close to the conclusion that George F. Kennan arrived at after World War II. Wilson's notion of a quarant to quarantine Bolshevism was broadly constru constructed in the Colby note, allied collective security and his own road away from revolution. America had to be strong, flexible, and patient. If Russia were contained, the communist system would collapse under its own weight, and that, in effect, became Kennan's policy. So Wilson's policy of informed containment had intellectual respectability, and it lent the containment policies of President Truman and George Marshall years before President Reagan's concept of an evil empire. And you can thus draw a straight line from Wilson and his collaborators down to Kennan and on to Reagan. Interpretations. Interpretations are often divided between realist and idealist, orthodox, revisionist. When applied to the Soviet Union, these divisions represented those who sided with efforts at accommodation, even cooperation, and with Russian czarist or communists, those who view Russia's relationships suspiciously or with hostility. But it is important for us to gain a clear understanding of Wilson's relationship with Russia because it contributed to a latter rationale for the Cold War. It may come as a surprise to some that his administration employed Cold War tactics, ideological warfare, espionage, armed intervention, blockade, economic isolation, laundering money, and quarantine. There was no arms race. It may further startle students of the debate that at the same time that Wilson's administration employed these tactics, he himself insisted on Russia's self-determination and territorial integrity. And how do you link that up with Wilson and sending troops to Russia? In fact, if there had been no Allied pressure on Wilson, there would have been no American troops uh, in Russia. And it was the Czech Legion that allowed him to justify it, but he continued to talk about self-determination for Russia and territorial integrity. He tried to get the Reds and the Whites together at the Paris uh, Peace Conference unsuccessfully. He tried to get the Reds and the Whites to negotiate a peace settlement at Prince Kipo. William C. Bullitt went to Moscow to explore a possible deal with Lenin. The Allies offered food relief to Lenin through the auspices of Nansen, the famous Norwegian Arctic explorer, uh, 
The president then adopted a watch and wait policy towards the counter-revolutionary Admiral Kolchak and his own government, but that government failed. Wilson never tried to abridge Russia's territorial integrity or limit Russian national sovereignty. To these principles, he remained true, and they help explain why he vigorously resisted intervention. And when the British and the French pressed it upon him, he placed the strictest limitations on American military intervention. Wilson concluded that diplomatic relations with the Soviets, calling as they did for the destruction of capitalism, were impossible, and his Secretary of State, Bainbridge Colby, announced non-recognition as Wilson's final policy, and that policy was continued on by Secretaries uh, Charles Evans Hughes, uh, who was uh, Warren Harding's Secretary of State. Both Colby and Hughes believed that their diplomatic and commercial quarantine would be imitated by other nations, but it was not because the British and the French recognized the Soviet Union in 1924, and likewise, eventually, President Franklin D. Roosevelt did in 1933. George Kennan, the architect uh, of containment, contended that <coughs> Bolshevik hostility to the West invited a similar reaction, equivalent to the creation of a state of war, part of the rationale for the Allied intervention of 1918. For Kennan, this non-classical war variant existed from Wilson's time and throughout the 20s. Wilson met initial uh, Bolshevik hostility in much the same way as his successors did, and Kennan picked it up in 1945 and 1946. After 1991, when the USSR collapsed in 1991, the pre-1939 shape of Eastern Europe that is, the one created by Wilson at the Versailles Peace Conference, reappeared. Today, the West seeks to preserve that shape <coughs> against President Vladimir Putin's presumed efforts to restore the Soviet sphere. <coughs> From Presidents Bill Clinton to Barack Obama, America and its European allies have brought the resurrected or newly created countries of Eastern Europe into uh, the European Union and into the North Atlantic Treaty, Treaty Organization, excuse me. Their eastern borders form a new red line of demarcation between the east and the west. Uh, and that is what is being contested right now. Much diplomacy, a surprising amount of it, fills the quarter century of post-Soviet uh, international relations and the Russian-American relations since the fall of communism in 1991. Yet little of it rises to the hope for level of collaboration. One scholar, Angela Stent, S-T-E-N-T, -E rightly terms these relations as limited re partnerships. And they have been largely partnerships on terrorism. Uh, that has been the major thing that we have, and arms controls. We've had some success, dramatic success in arms control, but these are transactional relationships with Russia. They are not part of a larger, warm, fuzzy relationship with Russia, which I do not believe will ever occur. Putin called Bush after uh, Bush 43 after the World Trade Tower attack of September and promised a partnership on Islamic terrorism. Now, you ought to be aware there's something in Russia's interest for that because they have major Islamic populations that are very unhappy. Um, one of the highlights of my trip to Moscow in, uh, the, when I was the Fulbright lecturer in 1981, they send Moscow State University, which has the premier American studies program, sends people out to other universities on so-called Komandorovkis. And one of my Komandorovkis was to Baku and then to Grozny in Chechnya. So I went to Chesnia uh, to give a couple of lectures. Uh, it was very nice uh, in Baku. They listened very attentively. There was a large auditorium uh, in Chechnya, uh, in Grozny. Uh, there must have been 300 people in the auditorium, 280 students and the party elite sitting in the first row. You're the party elite. One of the students asked the question, what was my reaction <coughs> 
to the recent dispatch of Soviet troops to Afghanistan. I said, mark my words, Afghanistan will turn into the Soviet Union's Vietnam. They threw me out. They sent me back to Moscow. I never got to give my second lecture. <laughs> the next morning, instead of delivering me to the lecture, they delivered me to the airport and said goodbye. <laughs> that area is so restive down there. That's why the Soviet Union is interested in talking to the United States about Islamic terrorism because they have Islamic terrorism like crazy in Russia, uh, in Dagestan, in Chechnya. Uh, so Putin immediately called Bush uh, and promised collaboration on that. But Bush never thought we would have equal partnership. He did want to continue the discussions on arms treaties that had obviously begun uh, seriously with Reagan and Bush. Uh, the missile defense systems, uh, moving to anti-ballistic missile systems treaties. Putin had much higher expectations. He wanted U.S. support for the Chechnya war, recognition of Russia's traditional Eastern European sphere of influence, equal partnership instead of an America-imposed agenda, an end to U.S. sermonizing over Chechnya, uh, and U.S. help in Russia's modernization. But after the United States invaded Afghanistan and NATO went in to Afghanistan, Putin's hopes for collaboration with the West seem to have faded. In hindsight, this have marked the moment of the high tide of Western, Russia's Western orientation. That ended right there. Since Russia's Crimea annexation of 2014, the European Union has introduced sanctions limiting Russia's banks, corporations, officials, and Ukrainian separatists from the West. State banks cannot raise long-term loans in the West. The export of military equipment from the West is restricted uh, uh, to Russia. Future US, uh, uh, European Union, Russian arms deals are banned, and Russia excluded, is excluded from new oil technology. The U United States' decision to place radars and interceptors in Poland and the Czech Republic, eventually adding them to Romania and Bulgaria, has disturbed Russia even further, so that uh, Putin suspended Russia's participation in the convention, a tr treaty on conventional forces in Europe. And Russia has dramatically objected to including the former European, Eastern European countries in NATO, uh, most recently, uh, they were, their fury over Montenegro, one of the former parts of Yugoslavia, who became part of NATO recently. They have, I think, an army of 2,000 troops uh, in Montenegro. Uh, that just has driven Putin nuts uh, in terms of uh, America refusing to understand that Russia has a major sphere of influence, and a major part of that is Eastern Europe. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have a president who has challenged NATO as obsolete, uh, and uh, a lot of the countries in NATO are now worried as to whether the United States uh, will abide by their treaty obligations, and in particular, the three that are most worried are Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Uh, because they may be, they have huge Russian populations. Uh, the Russian population, I believe in Estonia, is like 40% Russian speaking, Russian uh, background families uh, in Estonia, and large populations in Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, and what if Putin is going to move into one of those countries? What will the United States and NATO do? And there's no guarantee what they will do. So, in summary, our relations with Russia have deteriorated dramatically since 1991. Uh, whether they have reached the point of a Cold War status, quarantine containment may still be open to debate. In that debate, as a result, Wilson remains relevant. <coughs> Conclusion. Here, in 2017, 100 years after Wilson decided that the differences between the United States 
and Soviet Russia <coughs> were so vast and difficult as to prevent normal relations, Americans generally are beginning to see that is true again. That the Russians just have a very different view of what foreign relations should do uh, and cover. Now recently, uh, the former president, Mikhail Gorbachev of the Soviet Union, the last president uh, of the Soviet Union, wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post where he appealed to the presidents of Russia and the United States that relations between the two were in a severe crisis and he noted that 1917 was the 30th anniversary of the beginning of the signing of the treaties to eliminate intermediate and short-range nuclear missiles. Uh, and these treaties had to be renewed and continued. But America has major issues with Russia. In an excellent article in the most recent issue of Foreign Affairs, the president of the Chicago Council of World Affairs and the former U.S. ambassador to NATO from 2009 to 2013 writes that under Putin, Russia has embarked on a s systematic challenge to the West. The goal is to weaken the bonds between Europe and the United States among European uh, Union members, undermine NATO's solidarity, and strengthen Russia's strategic position in its immediate neighborhood and beyond. So the question and his conclusion is that Russia poses a threat unlike any the United States and its allies have faced since the end of the Cold War. It is a challenge that the United States and its European allies can only meet through unity and strength. If they fail to unite and bolster NATO's defense capabilities, Europe's future stability and security may well be in peril. One hopes that we have finally come to understand that America must remain an integral part of the European balance of power and never a part-time player whose primary attentions have drifted elsewhere. Wilson's influence remain, but will his policy, if needed, prevail? We may be optimistic, but we cannot exactly be joyful at the prospects in the era of Donald Trump. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, which I thought was very, very good uh, and uh, much more accessible to the general reader than Kennan's book on this similar subject that it is the decision to intervene. Yes. However, um, having read that, I think it would be great for me to read. I, I can't think of uh, how much I, I disagree with many of the things you said in it, but I'm not going to get into that. I do have one question about this. Uh, it's, Wilson um, uh, invades the Soviet Union with, with uh, military with the U.S. Army. In 1919, they dismember European Russia to break the cordon sanitaire. Mm -hmm. um, he refuses recognition to the, to the Bolshevik regime. And then you say on page 202, but, but, and I think Wilson's policy was incoherent. By the time of the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, it had become evident that isolation served no purpose. But I think that's that's kind of like the foundation of Wilson's policy. And then you say, on page 206, there was a 14-year hiatus during which Roosevelt tried to play the inside game. He lost. Yeah. Well, it's hard to say, on one hand, that non-recognition served no purpose, and recognition in the Soviet Union was a loser's game. Yeah. So what should be you know, it's interesting. I look at presidents, um, and if you look at eight presidents, Wilson, FDR, Truman, Kennedy, Nixon, Reagan, George Bush, the second, 43, and Trump. Seven of those presidents, or six of them, advocated what Wilson did. That the differences between the United States and Russia, and forget the Soviet Union and communism for a second, because I think it is actually more 
a thousand years of Russia and their view of themselves and relations are never going to, they're going to be transactional. We're going to be able to do a little bit with this and a little bit with that, but no overall. And I think Wilson understood that. Now, when you say uh, the policy towards the Bolsheviks, remember 1917, 1918, 1919, Bolshevism was evolving into what it later became. So he, you know, he nor anybody else knew that. The only president who played the inside game, we can be friends with the Soviet Union, we can recognize them, uh, was FDR. So are there similarities between FDR's view and Trump's view? Interesting question. Somebody else can analyze that. Uh, because what do we remain, what, what is the major legacy that people will tell you about uh, FDR and uh, the Russians? Yalta, that's what they'll tell you. That was not such a great success, Yalta, right? Well, I would also disagree about that, too. Okay. <laughs> I have a different take on Yalta, also. Okay. You have a different take on a lot of things. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, sir. Some people might tell you. <laughs> Could you compare a couple of periods? Yeah. Right after World War II, Truman sent George Marshall to China. Yes. Oh, I think it was anybody would have. In the period right after World War I and during the Civil War, between yeah. the Reds and the Whites, what were, the, were there efforts that Wilson made? Did Wilson have someone oh, yeah. on site is there, that was trying to mediate in that Civil War? Um, and was Wilson, uh, did Wilson resist intervening in to intervene in the Civil War. Oh, yeah. He, I mean, he clearly was uncomfortable with the sending of the troops, and I don't believe if there had not been extraordinary pressure exerted by the British uh, and the French that he would have ever sent the troops, and he tried to limit the troops uh, uh, as to what they could do and what they could not do. And Lansing proposed a political high commissioner, uh, and he said, no, these troops are going. They're going to help get uh, guard the supplies and get the checks out of Murmansk, Archangel, uh, and uh, 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 Vladivostok. Uh, you know, there were many evenings that four months that I spent as a Fulbright lecturer at Moscow University where you would sit around the table with a bottle of vodka, uh, and eventually the subject of the American troops would come up. How you have invaded us, we never invaded you. That was sort of the... But I am telling you that without the pressure from the Allies, and he tried to be a good soldier, you heard the quote I said uh, of uh, what he said uh, to Foch, uh, that Foch would have to go on the line and say this was important. Uh, that's why those troops went. But they went with severe limitations, uh, and they were withdrawn as quickly as they could have been at the end of the war. He really did believe in territorial integrity, uh, and he did believe in self-determination. So, um, you know, I believe he was right. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, and I don't believe we have any strategy now. That's part of the problem. Uh, we need a strategy. The goal has to be to prevent China and Russia from coming together. That has to be the principal goal of American foreign policy, because if they ever do, it's tap city for the United States in terms of our influence in the world. And that will have to do with trade policy. It will have to do with a whole bunch of other things. So. Uh, the second, uh, or the third book I mentioned uh, is this book uh, called Distorted Mirrors, Americans and Their Views of Russia and China in the 20th Century. So I've spent a lot of time in China also. Uh, 
uh, taught uh, briefly, uh, given lectures all over China. Um, I believe we can do a deal, a long-term deal, don't know what it is, with China. They're more rational. They have more to protect. I don't believe such a long-term deal can be done with Russia. And I say this, it's painful to me because I have lots of friends. Uh, in fact, I had four doctoral students uh, at the time I was at Moscow University shepherd me around, going on these Kamandorovskis, uh, taking me to the ballet. I must have gone to the Bolshoi 15 times in the four months I was there. Uh, I love ballet. Uh, and we got a great ballet here in Richmond, I must say. Uh, but one of those students is a guy by the name of Vasislav Nikonov, Slava Nikonov. You've seen him on television. His English is as good as yours and mine. Uh, he grew up in an elite family, and I'll tell you who that elite family is in a moment, <clears throat> and was in an English language school for his whole uh, career. Um, he's now a Putin man. He's a member of Duma. He is also Molotov's grandson. And those kind of people are now co-opted by Putin. Uh, and it is Russian nationalism. It is not communism. It is the Russian perception of themselves. Uh, and I believe that uh, the remark that President Obama made of Russia being a regional power really ticked not Putin off alone, but the whole country, because they view themselves as much more than a regional power. So what you've got to try to do is get from Wilson to the current and not just focus on communism. Remember, what is communism? Communism is allegedly what the Soviets tried to do in Russia. It's also what the Chinese try, have done and are still doing in China. It's a very different thing. The cap uh, communism under the Chinese has capitalism. What's the most important thing? It's transactions, dollars. Uh, so you've got to get past the, the issue of the historic thought uh, of uh, Bolshevism. So what I'm focused on now is, is a deal possible with China? Is a deal possible with Russia? And this is where I really, and I'm staying out of the politics of collusion. That's somebody else's business. They're much wiser people than me. I do not believe, and apparently Trump does believe, that a major deal is possible with Russia. That's the wrong deal as far as I'm concerned. The more important deal is going to be with the Chinese where we and the Chinese uh, have to agree on what the deal is. Um, remember, Nixon played the Chinese or the Russian card or the Chinese card vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. He didn't play the Chinese card. Mao played the American card. <laughs> the Chinese and the Russians were almost at war then. And what Mao wanted to do was get out of that box of being dependent upon the Russians. So he determined it was in the Chinese interest, the people, the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party, to establish major long-term relationships with the United States. We need to determine the same thing with China. And let me tell you, it is not over North Korea. That is very small in terms of consideration. If we give away everything else, trade and uh, uh, the South China Sea, uh, uh, Chinese military bases all over the world to get them to stop selling oil to China, I mean to North Korea, that's a crazy deal. But there is a deal that is possible, but it is going to take our best minds for a, over a long period of time to figure out what the deal is possible. There is no comparable deal that is possible with Russia. Other questions? <clears throat>